things are going so smoothly. That's good. Um, OK, next up we have Michaela. Take it away, Michaela. Hey, everybody. I'm Michaela, and I'm here to talk to you about risk management and why it's really not that scary, I promise. So I was, a few years ago, a little baby pen tester learning how to break things. Um, but after a short while, it became really apparent to me that I was looking at symptoms and not root causes. I could tell people where their vulnerabilities were, but I couldn't tell them why they had vulnerable code ending up on my desk in the first place. So I slowly transitioned into being a risk consultant. Then I couldn't find enough risk management in my life, so I added some recreational risk management in the form of being a circus artist. <laughs> and this is going to sound ridiculous, but I really love risk management. Risk management processes that are just right for whatever organization they're in, and they make people's lives easier and smoother while helping reduce risk genuinely make me so happy. It's like a perfectly fitting bra. It's uplifting, it's supporting, but it's not restrictive. It doesn't hold you back. And I see so many organizations thinking risk management is this big, scary thing that they can't do because they don't have a team of people or a tool implemented. And I promise you, it's not that scary. And I just really want to show you how simple it can be. So, First, I just want to demystify some of the terms that you see risk people throw around. I'm going to use this, explain this using an analogy because I'm a consultant and of course I'm going to. Um, so a risk is a bad thing that might happen. Often we define this in terms of impact and likelihood. So how bad will it be and how likely is it to occur? When we use the term inherent risk, we mean how bad is it and how likely is it if we do nothing about it at all. So as an example, if I jump off a bridge, my inherent risk of injury is pretty high. And because I have a low risk appetite for injury, which is how much risk we are willing to accept, I don't just go around jumping off bridges. But I really love bungee jumping. And when I bungee jump, the bungee cord is a control and the control reduces my residual risk to within my risk appetite, meaning I'm willing to take that risk to have fun. And now, risk management is something that's ingrained in all of us. It's how humans have survived as a species forever. The inherent risk of burning yourself when you take something out of the oven is high, so you apply the control of oven mitts to change the residual risk. It's like we all have a team of risk consultants somewhere in our gut with a massive Excel risk model turning around to us and shouting, no, too risky, apply controls, periodically. But where it gets a bit trickier is in organizations where suddenly it's not just you. And you need to turn your risk management from this instinctual, implicit process somewhere in your gut to an explicit process that you can collaborate on. And in order to do this, you need to communicate it somehow. Which brings me to my key message today. If you take only one thing away from this talk, make it the following. Please write things down. I know, I know, everyone hates documentation, it's the worst. But writing stuff down lets you do two really important things. It lets you look at it later, and it lets you communicate it. My second key message is that if something is worth doing, it's probably worth half-assing it. If we all agree that eating fruit and vegetables is a positive thing, and you're not ready for five plus a day, eating one vegetable is probably better than none. It's the same with risk management. While you may not be ready for the gold-plated version of the process with some fancy GRC tool, something is almost always better than nothing. So the first risk process I want to show you how to half-ass is a risk register. So you know all those times that you have to make a decision. And while you know it's 
probably the right decision at the time, or you just don't have any other options, but there's something that just doesn't quite sit right with you, and you're pretty sure this might bite you in the ass sometime, just write it down. I know these moments are often high pressure, you probably can't write everything down, but the best part about writing down just a little something is that you can come back to it later. And once the pressure is off, you can come back to it and decide, you know, in the calm, whether you're gonna do anything about it. And maybe you don't, maybe you don't wanna do something about that and you're okay with it and you leave it there. And maybe a year from now, your context has changed. Maybe your business has tripled in size or your regulatory environment is different. And maybe now you wanna do something about that. But if you hadn't written anything down a year ago and you'd forgotten about it, taking action now isn't a decision you're able to make. That decision's already been made for you. So I've made a little wee template for how you could record some of these risks. You should definitely change it for your context because my perfectly fitting bra is not your perfectly fitting bra. But at the moment, what it's got to start you off with is what's a thing that might suck? How much is it gonna suck if it happens? How hard would it be to completely eliminate the risk? What can we do to reduce the risk? And then what are we gonna do about it? So, to walk you through an example from my life, I have recently picked up trapeze as a hobby. This involves me in the air doing physical activity, and I am the clumsiest person I know. So my risk of injury is pretty high. Now if I get injured really badly, that would suck quite a lot. But to eliminate the risk, I would need to give up trapeze. And I don't want to do that. But to reduce the risk, I have a ton of options. If we first look at controls that reduce the likelihood of the risk occurring, which are kind of the next best thing after completely eliminating the risk, I can only work with experienced instructors, I can warm up, I can not do things that I'm not ready or strong enough for. And then to think about controls that, that reduce the impact of the risk, if they do happen, I can make sure that I have a crash mat so that I injure myself a bit less. And then if we think about controls that, okay, if everything happens and it's bad, how do we get back to normal sort of recovery controls? I can work with a physio to resolve all my injuries quickly. And all of these compensating controls, they don't eliminate my risk but they do bring it back to within my risk appetite. But as I age and I recover less quickly, my context might change and I need to revisit it to determine whether my current treatment of the risk is the right course of action. And maybe I want to add more compensating controls or eliminate the risk entirely. Unfortunately, there often isn't an option to eliminate the risk entirely particularly in the tech world. I mean, your options to completely eliminate the risk of someone hacking your stuff is get off the internet, stop all operations, which isn't really realistic. Meaning you kind of have to play in this compensating controls, reducing your risk space. And as your context changes and the wider risk context changes, you probably want to be revisiting how you're doing that pretty regularly. And having a risk register that you actually look at can help with that. The second process I wanna show you how to half-ass is a risk assessment. Now, all a risk assessment is, is a prioritization tool and a filtering tool. It lets you put your effort where it matters. For example, when you're engaging a new vendor, some organizations might have the rule that you must talk to security. But if you're the sort of organization that only has one security person, that person often becomes a massive bottleneck, slowing the whole process down. And we all know that once this process happens and it's slow and it's cumbersome, people will find a way to subvert it. Meaning your security person may never actually get to be involved in the decisions that they really need to be. 
What a risk assessment does is it puts a filter in front of the security person to make it more likely that they only see the things that they actually need to and everyone can move a little faster. And writing a risk assessment is usually really easy because your security person is already implicitly doing one pretty much every time someone comes to them with a question. To continue with the vendor example, if I go up to a security person and go, hey, I want to engage this vendor, what should I do? They'll probably ask me, what data are they going to receive? How reliant on their service will we be? How much integration are they going to have with our systems? And to reiterate my favorite message, if you take these questions and you just write them down, people can ask themselves instead of the security person asking them, and they can escalate to security only if needed. I'll chuck a template of the risk assessment in the great archive, but I would strongly encourage you to change the questions to your risk context. The only question I wouldn't change is the final one, and I like to make this the final question on all risk assessments in all contexts, and that's, does this feel high risk? That's because, like I mentioned earlier, we all have a team of consultants somewhere in our gut, and sometimes they just sit there and shout at us, and we don't always know why. We may not have the technical language to explain exactly why someone is shouting at us that this is high risk. But we should usually pay attention to that feeling. And you can use this type of risk assessment in a bunch of contexts, whether that's third parties, like I mentioned, or deploying new changes to production, or building out your business continuity plans. So, in summary, a lot of risk management is just taking the instinctual decisions we already make based on the risk model in our gut and taking them from implicit to explicit. And in order to do that and communicate it clearly, we need some enablers, such as a common language, which we ran through, along with some shared processes that we agree on and have written down so other people can use them. These processes don't need to be gold-plated. They only need to be just fancy and comprehensive enough to serve you, because risk management should really be something that you can use to help you, as opposed to something you have to do as an afterthought. I hope at least some of you are at least 10 percent as amped about risk management as I am. Um, and thank you very much. Have a great afternoon.